All right, I want to thank you for joining us uh, this evening as we continue uh, this uh, season of the coronavirus and having to be limited in our outreach, but we're glad for uh, everyone that's joining us online and uh, those uh, that are here with us. Uh, trust the service will be a blessing to you tonight as we again have another streamlined uh, service this evening. But we're uh, thankful that God's in control and I hope that you're resting in Him uh, in these uh, days. And church family, I want to express to you that uh, I'm uh, grateful for all of you and we're thankful that uh, for the, those we've been able to connect with in, in these days and for your faithfulness to the Lord. And we'll keep our eyes on him. I, I look forward to the day when we can all be together again uh, here at uh, Bethel. And uh, look forward to uh, hopefully that, that uh, some freedom being allowed there even in the next week or two. So we'll, we'll continue to pray that uh, God will protect us, our church family. As far as I know, for our church family, not, no one in our church family is uh, dealing with this, uh, this virus. So we're thankful for that information. We want to continue to hold our... Uh, church family up in prayer, especially our people on the front lines, many uh, who work in the medical field. Let me pray, and then Andrea is going to sing a, a special for us this evening. Then I'll preach for a little bit, and uh, we'll, that'll be our service for tonight. So let's pray and ask for the Lord's blessing on our time together. Our Father, we're grateful for uh, your great love uh, to us. We're thankful, Lord, for the way that you are ministering to the needs of our hearts and minds and souls uh, in uh, the midst of uh, these uncertain times and certain days. And Lord, our minds are uh, filled uh, most days with uh, the latest news, the latest numbers. Uh, what's the government going to do here in the state? What's the government going to do in Washington? Well, Lord, I pray that you'd help us in these few moments to focus on uh, you and what you desire to do uh, in us and through us. And Lord, uh, we can certainly see that uh, you have gotten the attention of many people around the world. And so, Lord, I pray that this would be a great uh, turning uh, to you, a great opportunity of reviving. I pray that folk would look to you, uh, many who need to be saved. But, Lord, we know that revival begins with we who are your people. And so, Lord, I pray that you'd help us to be willing to uh, travel uh, the road to revival as we look at that tonight in Nehemiah. Lord, I pray your blessings again on our time. Thank you for each one that's uh, observing online. I pray that their connections would work fine, they'd not be distracted, they'd be able to, to uh, tune in to you uh, this evening and your word and what you have for us. I'll play your bless Andrea now as she uh, sings a special for us. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>
Amen. Aren't you thankful His grace is sufficient? For whatever our need may be and the needs that we're carrying uh, in these days. Nehemiah chapter 9 in your Bible uh, this evening. Nehemiah chapter 9 as we continue our series here through the book of Nehemiah. We'll pick it up in verse 1. Nehemiah chapter 9 and verse 1 and I'll read down uh, through verse 6. I'm probably going to skip some of these names here as we get to verses 4 and 5 and uh, I hope you'll be all right with that. Verse, uh, verse 1, Nehemiah 9. Now in the twenty and fourth day of this month, the children of Israel were assembled with fasting and with sackcloth and earth upon them. And the seed of Israel separated themselves from all strangers and stood and confessed their sins and the iniquities of their fathers. And they stood up in their place and read in the book of the law of the Lord their God one-fourth part of the day, which would have been three hours, uh, 12 hours of the working day. And another fourth part they confessed, another three hours, and worshiped the Lord their God. Verse 4, then stood up upon the stairs of the Levites, Jeshua, several other fellows, and cried with a loud voice unto the Lord their God. And then the Levites, Jeshua, and some of these same fellows and some others, uh, said, Stand up and bless the Lord your God forever and ever. Blessed be thy glorious name, which is exalted above all blessing and praise. Thou, even thou, art Lord alone. Thou, shalt, thou hast made heaven, the heaven of heavens, with all their hosts, the earth and all things that are therein, the seas and all that is therein. And thou preservest them all, and the host of heaven worship, worshipeth thee. The road to revival. Father, thank you for the opportunity that we have to gather in, in your house tonight and gather online to so many of our church family as well. Lord, uh, we're grateful that in this uh, these days that we have uh, many of our missionary families that are able to dip in and, and uh, join us. And Lord, I pray your hand of blessing upon them as they're dealing with this virus, many of them in their countries as well. I pray you give them wisdom as they a desire to be a help to, in many cases, to young believers. And, and Lord, I pray this would not be a time of uh, them uh, falling away, but Lord, a time of uh, strengthening as uh, some of them have to grow up uh, a little quicker than perhaps anticipated. Lord, I pray that we as a church family would seek you in these days and not allow Satan to gain an advantage uh, over us or in us, but that we would be yielded to you and allow you to strengthen us through it. Lord, we, we know that we need revival. We know that our nation and our world needs revival. And uh, Lord, we recognize that it is not a mistake that we are at this place in our study through the book of Nehemiah uh, at this time. You knew exactly the events that would take place. You knew where we'd be. And Lord, I thank you for uh, the privilege it's ours to look into your word and gain some, some encouragement, some challenge, truth that will be a help to us in these days. I pray, Father, for your power and presence and filling upon me as I deliver the message tonight. Help me to speak clearly. Give me, Lord, that which you would have each one listening to hear and receive, and Lord, help us to be wise with your word. We pray and ask these things in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Nehemiah, Nehemiah 9 here. Uh, we are, we are uh, past the place of the construction of the wall and uh, their desire uh, to understand the word of God. Chapter 8 has been filled with, with uh, the word of God being delivered, uh, taught so that it is understood, and now uh, let's put it into practice. We get here to chapter 9, and I, I think this is going to be two messages. It may end up being three here in this, this chapter. Uh, but chapter 9 is focused on, on revival. And uh, tonight I want us to consider the road to revival. Are, are we willing, are you willing to travel the revival road, the path that God would desire for us to travel if we're going to see revival personally? And by the way, that's how revival would happen uh, in a certain location, in a church, in a nation, in the world, when individuals determine that uh, they will seek revival. I don't know who said it first. I know that uh, Moody's uh, statement about uh, the circle and revival has been oft repeated. I've heard it attributed to other preachers uh, as well, but I think Moody certainly made it, made it famous. 
If you, if you desire revival, the thing to do is to draw a circle, stand in the circle, and ask God to revive everything within the circle. Uh, revival begins with you, and it begins with me. Uh, but are we willing to travel that revival road? Uh, most of you know that I enjoy uh, fishing. I, uh, years ago, enjoyed uh, hunting. I uh, don't, uh, don't hunt as, uh, too much anymore. I've kind of lost my passion for that. Uh, being involved with my uh, kids and their youth and sports uh, kind of distracted me from uh, the hunting aspect, but I still enjoy fishing. And uh, usually I, we have a, uh, our first vacation of the summer. Of course, those are all suspect in these days. We wonder if we're going to get to travel again, but uh, I'm sure we will. We'll get through this. But uh, our first uh, uh, trip right after school gets out, and usually we're, we're needing a little bit of a break, and we go uh, to northern Michigan. We go on a fishing trip. And uh, most people that fish, if they fish very much, have, uh, have their favorite spot. Like a hunter would have his favorite blind to be in or whatever, or, or favorite place to go if they're a bird hunter. Or as a fisherman, you kind of have your, your uh, honey holes, we call them, or the place you like to fish. And, and we have, our family is uh, located one where we like to fish. And, and uh, the, the requirements, though, to get to this fishing hole are, uh, it's a laborious road. Uh, we travel several miles on a one-lane gravel road, uh, twisting and turning through uh, deep forest. It's, it's thick forest, thick forest area. Then we get to the end of that gravel road. The, the road ends, and the, the uh, state has set up a barricade so people can't drive any further because you get back in there, you could get stuck or whatever. And, and we, we, we park there, and then we have to hike about a mile back to our, our fishing hole. In waders, you say, well, that's no big deal. Well, friend, it is. It's a long hike back there, and the time you get back there, uh, you're about exhausted, and uh, it's a long uh, journey. But we make that journey through that. Sometimes we're wading through knee-deep water, and, and uh, last year it was flooded. We we were in water almost the entire trip. You ever try walking through water for a mile? It's difficult, and in waders, it's even a little more difficult. Uh, but we travel back here. Why would we go through all that struggle? because we want to get to that spot. We were anticipating that if we can get to our favorite fishing spot, and all of us have our spot in that spot that we like to go to, we've got our kind of our zone that we like to go fish uh, as we wade around and, and fish, uh, we, we think that the, the payoff is going to be worth the, the road, the journey to get to that, uh, that uh, fishing hole. Just like a deer hunter would perhaps get up early in the morning and, and walk through the woods in the dark, those are weird things. I can't believe all the times I've done that. Why in the world would you be walking out in the woods in the wilderness with who knows what out there in the dark with a little bitty flashlight? You can't hardly see 10 feet in front of you. But we've got to get to our favorite blind because that's the favorite spot. Uh, we would be willing to travel that road because we think there's going to be something at the end of the road that's worthwhile. Revival is a wonderful word, isn't it? It speaks of being resuscitated given life again. You know, we're living in unusual days where uh, here in Ohio, uh, we wake up every morning and we get the national statistics about the number of people that are, are have, uh, have the coronavirus present in our, in our nation or in the world. And here in Ohio, every afternoon, we get an update telling us uh, how many people have it, uh, how many are in the hospital, and usually the last number they give is how many have died uh, because of this uh, virus. It's, a, it's an unusual time we're living in where we're, we're counting the number of deaths because of this, this virus. And it's a sobering thought. But there's also uh, some of these statistics that come out. They have a, a, a deal. I think it's John Hopkins, uh, their uh, website not only shows the number of people worldwide that have it, but it also has a statistic there of the number that have recovered. They've recovered. They've, they're past the disease. They've made it through uh, this uh, terrible virus, and they've recovered. They're, they're beyond it. When you think about resuscitation, we obviously would think about someone who is, is uh, near death or without aid is going to, going to die. They need to be resuscitated. Most often, we equate as believers, spiritually speaking, revival, times of revival, with many conversions. 
And there have certainly been several famous revivals in our history that we know about where, where thousands, um, perhaps many thousands of people came uh, to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. They were, they were saved uh, as the fruit of a revival. And many times we think about a great revival, we think about a lot of people getting saved. And there's nothing wrong with thinking that way. That is a reality that, that does happen. Many people turning to Christ, uh, believing the good news, the gospel, that Jesus Christ is the only way of redemption. And by the way, he is the only way of redemption. It's only through faith in Jesus Christ. There's no other way to heaven but through the Lord Jesus Christ. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. You say, well, that sounds awful narrow-minded and awful exclusive. Well, it is exclusive. Christ is the only way. And by the way, he owns heaven. He owns the right to it. So he gets to determine the rules for how we get in. Man, I can't decide that. You can't decide that. Christ is the only way of redemption. But we think about revivals. We think about a lot of people getting saved. But the fact of the matter is that the, the power of God uh, moving in an unusual, miraculous way, where many lost people turn to Christ, is, in fact, the result of a revival among God's people. It's the result of God's people being resuscitated into a correct uh, position in their relationship with God, being, being revived in their, their walk with the Lord. Revival has been described this way, or defined this way. It means to recover life and vigor. Another definition is to return to consciousness. One of my friends uh, says it this way, a return to Bible truth or Bible principle. You think about recovering life and vigor, return to consciousness. It is a return to Bible truth, a Bible principle. When we are, we are renewed, we are returned to a right consciousness of God and who he is. This chapter is a testimony of the faithfulness of God's promise that he gave to his people in 2 Chronicles 7, verse 14, where the Bible says this, If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. This chapter is a testimony of the faithfulness of God to fulfill that promise. And we see here in Nehemiah's day that the people are returning to God, asking him to, to asking him, confessing their sin and asking him to again restore them to heal their land. And as we continue in this chapter in the weeks ahead, uh, Lord willing, uh, we will look at how God was faithful to his people time and time again to bring them revival when they returned to him in repentance and faith, desiring that he would forgive their sin and he would heal their land. We need God to forgive the sin of America. We are a sinful nation. We stand in a place where we deserve the great judgment of God. We have for decades aborted innocent life. We have for many years now, tried to justify wicked, wicked sin. We're passing laws. Listen, God, God doesn't wink at our sin. He doesn't, doesn't uh, grin and pat us on the head and say, go on with it. God will judge sin. In these days, we're hearing tragic things going on in our world where uh, some kind of modification of euthanasia is going on where they're choosing who they're going to whose life they're going to save and who they're going to let die. It hurts me to even say those things. All life is valuable. We stand in a position where we deserve the great judgment of God. And there is no doubt that anybody, anybody with any kind of spiritual brain at all cannot, would have to say, Lord, what are you trying to get across to me here? God, what, you, what message are you trying to give to me? You'd have to be completely uh, rebellious and rejecting of the obvious not to turn to God in these days. God's trying to get our attention. As we see here with 
the nation of Israel at this time, and this is amazing, they have enjoyed some great success. They've been able to travel back from captivity. They've been able to rebuild this wall. They've uh, now dug into the word of God, and you would think it would be a time for them to maybe, and we saw the great feasting they enjoyed in the last chapter, but the more they learn the, and study the word of God, the more they're gaining an understanding of, whoa, we've got some uh, fessing to do. We've got some sin that needs to, we need to confess to God, we need to get right with the Lord. The road to revival, first of all, there must be a sober humility. We see that in verse 1, that the, the nation of Israel, now on the 24th day of the month, the, the children of Israel were assembled with fasting, with sackcloth, cloth, and, and earth upon them. Uh, they, they, were, they were, first of all, they were, were persistent in their humility. Persistent in pursuing God. 24 days. This is the 20 and 4th day. You remember that they had 8 days in a row where they were there. This is now the 24th day of this month. They're still interested in hearing from God. Uh, we know that they spent at least 6 hours on this day uh, meeting. Uh, they had word, the Word of God read for 3 hours and then they confessed for 3 hours. Uh, they were busy. They were, they were persistent in pursuing the Word of God. And listen... Therefore, they were persistent in pursuing the will of God. It wasn't just head knowledge here they wanted. They wanted to know what God's word said so that they could apply it to their life and they could be following the will of God. They dug into the word of God. They were persistent in discovering the word of God so that they could therefore know what the will of God was for them to do. And we see, and if I already mentioned, they spent uh, three hours reading the word of God, three hours confessing and worshiping God. A six-hour service, if you will. Persistence is required. There's a, sober, there's a sober humility here. I want you to think about something else. Not only persistence required, but pride is rejected. Pride is rejected. They, they uh, were fasting. They were in sackcloth and earth upon them. Uh, they were humbling themselves before the Lord, and uh, they confessed their sins and iniquities uh, of their their of the history of their their fathers of the of their nation pride was pride was rejected proverbs 16 18 the famous verse about pride pride goeth before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall pompousness has no place in christian service pride is a killer in christian service Pride will, will slay the minister as well as a ministry. A ministry that gets puffed up with pride, uh, God can cut you down to your knees in a hurry as well as a minister. Some people think that they're, they're uh, too big to fail, so to speak, as far as ministry goes. Uh, God can do his work without any of us. Pride and pompousness have no place in Christian service. Christ, our example humbled himself, and he served with humility. In Philippians chapter 2, if you want to flip over there quickly, Philippians chapter 2, and before I forget it, you want to mark that because we're going to be going right back near there in a few moments. Philippians chapter 2, and I want us to look at verse just two verses here for now, verses 7 and 8. Christ was our was it is our great example. He humbled himself and he served with humility. Notice Philippians 2 verse 7. Speaking of Christ, uh, let's read verse 5. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. In verse 7, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Christ was marked by humility. Pride is a chief attribute of Satan. You ever think about that? Pride is, is a chief, if not the chief attribute of Satan. Remember the I wills of Satan. Satan was full of himself. Uh, lots of pomp and circumstance surround what he wanted done. Uh, Satan, the enemy of our souls, pride is his chief attribute, while humility is the chief attribute of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Savior of our souls. So pride is the great attribute of the enemy of our souls, while humility is the great attribute, among many, 
of our Savior, the Savior of our souls. There's a sober, sober, a serious humility on this road to revival. I want us to notice secondly tonight, in verse 2, we see a separated honesty. A separated honesty. And the seed of Israel separated themselves from all strangers and stood and confessed their sins and the iniquities of their fathers. A separated honesty. If we're going to travel, traverse this revival road, we have to come clean with God. We have to get honest before the Lord. The essence, uh, A.W. Tozer said this, the essence of idolatry is the entertainment of thoughts about God that are unworthy of Him. We have, we have idolized our methods and our way above uh, our relationship with God. We have to have the Lord first and preeminent in our life. It's, it's all about Him. We tend to be offended. Listen, we need to come clean with God. The essence of idolatry is the entertainment of thoughts about God uh, that are unworthy of Him. We tend, my thought here, we tend to be offended and frustrated with God when He doesn't do what we want Him to do. We get upset with God. We get frustrated with God when He doesn't do what we want Him to do because we think we know what he should do. Is that not idolatry? When we get frustrated with God because he doesn't do what we want him to do or we think he should do, is that not placing ourselves in his position? He is God alone. We have to come clean with God. The hymn writer said, Take time to be holy. And we certainly should. You know, I'm a probably one of the more time conscious uh, preachers uh, that I know. That could be good or bad. But one of our problems in our time is we won't take the time to be holy. We rush through everything. You know, it is, it is as though in these weeks and uh, how long this is going to go on, we don't know. I mean, we've heard all kinds of crazy. I've heard estimates that are, uh, I hope it's not uh, some of these extreme estimates that go into the summer months. I don't think that way. I, I think we're down to a matter of uh, weeks here, if, if not uh, days. Uh, a few more, you know, eight, seven, to, seven to ten days, I hope. But God has allowed all of us to take a time out. You ever have your kids take a time out? Oh, hey, Junior, Junior, Ed, you better go, go in your room and just cool off a little bit. Ever need a time out yourself? Somebody at work? Yes, I'm a pastor. We have a Christian school. Somebody at work gets me frustrated. Sometimes it's good for me to just go take a time out and gather my thoughts a little bit. One of the things I try to do, I wish I could say I do it all the time, but I don't. I'm a sinner like the rest of us. Uh, when someone challenges me or something, when, you know, or someone asks me a question, I'm, I'm trying to swim for the answer and trying to come up with that sharp, quick answer. I'm trying to get better at saying, Lord, give me wisdom here and how to respond to this. But we need to humble ourselves before the Lord. Take time to be holy. That doesn't mean you have to spend six hours. but it means you should be willing to. Take time to be holy. In our world, we say, let's take time to be holy, and you've got about 27 minutes left. Let's take the time to be holy. We have to come clean with God if we're going to have a separated honesty. And I use that word honesty for this purpose. We have to confess to God. We have to confess. They, they separated themselves from all the strangers and stood and confessed their sins and the iniquities of their fathers. Now, I want us to think about this, this confession and famous verses for confession were 1 John, right? Uh, we know verse 9. Let me read verse 8 for you first. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. 
If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let's think, let's break that down a little bit. If we, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. So if we say that we have no sin, we're not being honest with ourselves, let alone with God. Right? So a separated honesty here is to confess, God, I am a sinner. I do sin. And what the nation of Israel, the, what the, the, the Jews had done here is they had spent a lot of time meditating in the word of God by listening to it and processing it and it being taught to them. And as this happened, they went, whoa, we need to separate from strangers. We need to, we need to come clean with God. We need to confess our sin to God. This is a separated honesty. Confession isn't just, Lord, I confess my sin, forgive me, amen, let's go on my way. Confession, confession is, is agreement with God. It's honesty with God about the matter. It's being forthright with God about the matter. Now, I... We have always, my wife and I have always had uh, this rule in our in, in rearing our children. Uh, if if they had done something wrong, and we confronted them about it, uh, if they fessed up right away, the punishment was a whole lot less than if we had to chase them around around the barn three times to get them to fess up. Right? If they confessed early, if they were honest about their wrong, then the punishment was not near as severe. As if, if, if they had lied to us about it and we had to, you know, work it out, so to speak. Sin is all around us. It's everywhere. The Lord Jesus Christ took time to wash the disciples' feet. Is a picture of the fact that as we journey, traverse this road in this world... We pick up the filth of the sinfulness of the world's way in our life, and we've got to keep ourselves clean. Confession is honesty with God. It's coming clean with God. Sin is, is all, all around us. I can't think of a better illustration than this. The obvious illustration for this is, is this one. It's our vigilance in keeping our hands clean and not touching our face that we all are becoming experts at doing in these last few days. I mean, how many times did you wash your hands today or use hand sanitizer? I, I knew what I was preaching tonight. I knew I was going to use this illustration, and I determined this morning I was going to count how many times I washed or used hand sanitizer uh, today. I tell you something, I lost track before lunchtime. We're doing it constantly. Why? Because we're scared to death that we're going to get this virus. I don't want it. I don't, I, don't, I, I don't want it myself. It'd be one thing for me to get it. It'd be another thing that if I get it, I'm probably going to pass it on to my, my family. I would hate for that to happen, right? None of us want it. Uh, none of us want it personally, but we certainly don't want to carry it up into, into people we love or, or our friends and coworkers and so on. So we're, we're, very, we're being very vigilant about making sure that our hands are kept clean. We're, we're being very... Uh, Specific about, hey, I touched this. I mean, I've touched the pulpit several times here tonight after we get done with the service. But hopefully, before if I don't do so out of habit, I'm not going to touch my face. I will wash my hands before I do anything else after the service tonight. Why? I don't want that filth on me, that virus. It's contagious and it could be deadly. We're very, very vigilant about washing our hands because we understand the the severity of the possibility of this contagious virus. How many sins or how many times did you confess sin to God today? Now, I know what you're thinking. Some of you are probably saying it out loud because you're in your living room and you can say it out loud. Pastor, do you think we have to confess every sin by name? No, I don't. But I want to say this, and I've given this some thought. If you aren't naming any sins in your confession, you probably aren't confessing. You're probably putting some conscience tab on it and going on your merry way and thinking you're okay with God. 
God is not some kind of confessional booth that we go and, Lord, forgive me of all this, and I'm going to go on my way and keep sinning. That's not confession. Confession is honesty before God. We agree with God about the matter that it is sin. True confession is agreement with God about the matter. And if you're in agreement with God about your sin, you're going to be following his directions, his uh, directives about keeping yourself from sin. And again, the great illustration is all of the extras that we're going through or the things we're going without in this time to avoid getting this virus. We have completely disrupted all of our lives in order to avoid the spread of this virus. I used this verse last week and I think maybe the week before. I don't know if it's because I can't find another verse or because it's the right verse, but I think it's because it's the right verse. Psalm 119, verse 9. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way by taking heed thereto according to thy word? How do you wash your hands? Well, well you've got to wash for 20 seconds and you need to sing a birthday song or something, you know, for 20 seconds and you need to go this way and that way. And all other kinds of craziness. How are you going to clean your life? Dig into the Word of God. They spent three hours reading it, and then they spent three hours confessing. Confession is honesty before God. We are saved by choosing Christ's way of redemption. And aren't you thankful it's so simple? We agree with God. I'm a sinner. Lord, I'm a sinner. You're the only Savior. Uh, please forgive me of my sin and save my soul. We, we, it, it's faith. We're, we're trusting God to do for us that what we cannot do for ourselves. We can't earn redemption. The way we're saved is, is by simple uh, application of the Word of God, obedience to the Word of God. We trust, we take God's Word, God and His Word, and what He said. We're saved by choosing Christ's way of redemption, trusting Christ, uh, receiving Him. We are sanctified, and the people here separated themselves from the strangers and stood and confessed their sins and iniquities. They, they were sanctified. They separated themselves. We're sanctified. Listen, it's the same way. It's by choosing Christ's way of living. Both salvation and sanctification require our faith. You trust, you get saved by obedience to Christ's command. It's your choice. You are sanctified, separated from sin and worldliness by choosing Christ's way of living. This, for the child of God, this isn't a matter of, well, if I don't confess my sin, then uh, God's going to get me. It's not that at all. The point is this. God has placed your sin, if you're saved, if you trust in Christ as your Savior, He's placed your sin, all of them, past, present, and future, under the blood of Christ. Your, your uh, position is in the, as a, in the family of God, you're saved. You, you belong to the Lord Jesus Christ. Those sins were placed on Christ when you received Him as your Lord and Savior. The, the, this confessing of our sin as a child of God isn't a matter of of whether or not we get into heaven. It's a matter of our fellowship with God. It's a matter of our walk with God, our relationship with Him. For the child of God, it's a matter of, of our, our fellowship with God. I can illustrate this in a couple family relationships. A husband and wife, right? If a, if a husband and wife love each other as, as they should, and if God has ordained as they've committed and vowed to each other their love, uh, they're, they're not going to live their life trying to make their spouse a frustrated mess. Right? Now, I'm not talking about sporting things. You know, we all have those kind of things where we kind of needle each other a little bit. But I'm talking about there are things, you know, if, if there's something I know that my wife hates, if I do it, then I'm not, if I do that, I'm, I'm provoking her. I'm, I'm trying to frustrate our relationship, right? I'm not helping my relationship with my wife and vice versa. Right? If my children uh, know that there are certain things that, that really displease me and they continue to do those things, our fellowship isn't going to be what it should be. It's the same way in our relationship with God. Right? Uh, if my child does something against me or they know displeases me or even rebels against me, it doesn't mean I love them any less. God doesn't love us any less. 
But if we're going to have our relationship restored and made right, it's going to require that we get right with him. Just like if I've done something I know aggravates my wife and it's wrong, it's not up to her to come get right with me. It's my responsibility to get right with her. And the same thing in the parent-child relationship. And by the way, in the parent-child relationship, that can work both ways. I've done things that, I, hey, you know, I'm sorry. I didn't mean that that way or I shouldn't have done that. Would you forgive me? Uh, we're human beings. We're all sinners. But our relationship with God, we should desire that fellowship with him that that he desperately wants with us. Every parent wants a right relationship with their child. And any husband or wife would want a right relationship with their spouse. I mean, if you don't, you've got a problem. I said, you know, you're not wired the right way if you're trying to aggravate your spouse. Get yourself right with the Lord and then ask the Lord to help you get your relationship with your husband or wife restored. So we see that there's a sober humility. There's a separated honestly. Lastly tonight, I want us to, to see this. There's a stand in honor. I see that in verse 3. And they stood up in their place and read in the book of the law of the Lord their God, one fourth part of the day and another fourth part they confessed and worshiped the Lord their God. They stood. Then we get down uh, to verse, um, uh, let's see, verse, middle of verse 5. Stand up and bless the Lord your God forever and ever. Blessed be thy glorious name, which is exalted above all blessing and praise. Thou, even thou, art the Lord alone. Thou hast made heaven, the heaven of heavens, and with all their hosts, the earth and all things that are therein, the seas and all that is therein, and thou shalt, thou, and thou preservest them all, and the host of heaven worshipeth thee. There's a stand here in honor. They acknowledged a personal Lord, a personal Lord, the law of the Lord, their God. Lord, this is your word. It's your law. It's, it's your, our God. It's the law of the Lord, their God. They worship the Lord, their God. This is what they acknowledged, a personal Lord. And in verse six, we see that they acknowledged a preeminent Lord. I've been privileged in my personal Bible reading. As many of you know, I, I read a Psalm and a proverb a day and then my other uh, Bible reading, but Many of the Psalms I've been reading have had to do with the fact that God's in control and that he, he controls, he's a creator or, or, and so on. And I'm so thankful for those portions of scripture that God gives to us right when we need them. God's in control. We can rest in the fact that God is in control. My Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ, is in control. This was a stand in honor, not because of who I am, but because of his grace and mercy extended to me. I, he's my Lord. I'm his child. I belong to him. This is a stand in honor. It's a stand in, in confidence, and I want to be honoring to the Lord. Jesus Christ is Lord of all. Jesus Christ will be acknowledged as Lord by all. Turn to, to uh, back over there. I ask you to keep your place there in, in uh, Philippians. Let's go back there. Philippians uh, 2. And notice with me now verse 9. Wherefore, God also hath highly exalted him, Philippians 2, 9, and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Jesus Christ is going to be acknowledged as Lord by all. Jesus Christ should be acknowledged as your Lord. Let me say it this way. Jesus Christ should be Lord of all of you and all of me. That in all things he might have the preeminence. Psalm 91.1, the Bible says, He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. What a wonderful, wonderful, precious verse. The late Warren Wiersbe said this about this passage. True worship involves hearing the scriptures, praising God, praying, decided, hey, I want to hear what the word of God says. I want to be busy about praising God, praying to him, confessing my sin, and separating ourselves from anything that displeases God. The road to revival includes a sober humility. Let's humble ourselves before the Lord. 
there are things going on in our world and in our lives that are out of our control. I'm thankful for what Washington, D.C. is trying to do to help many who are no doubt going to be in a, in a difficult way uh, economically because of the links that have been taken. I'm thankful for that. I'm thankful that we live in a country with the greatest health care in the world. I'm grateful for that. And, and we can have some confidence in what Washington's doing to help us economically. We can have some confidence in our health care system. But listen, friend, at the end of the day, God is in control. Our confidence is in Him. And we're grateful for these other entities that He has raised up. He's the great physician. And he's the one who gives the increase. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills. The Lord Jesus Christ is worthy of of our sober humility, our separated honesty, and a stand for him in honor of his great name. The road to revival may have some difficulties, but the abundant Christian life that is enjoyed when we seek revival and are revived is well worth that difficult path. Listen, I enjoy where I go fishing, and it's a difficult path getting back there, but catching a fish is nothing like having a right relationship with God. The road to revival. He is worthy. Father, help us, I pray, to make appropriate application of this passage and this message to our hearts and lives this evening. Lord, if you've spoken to hearts about some sin that needs to be confessed, Lord, I pray that we would come clean with thee. I pray that we'd get honest before you and get those things right. Lord, as uh, those sinful habits pop up in our life throughout the day, Lord, I pray you'd prick our heart with the truth, that we would confess and agree with you about it, and Lord, make the appropriate change according to your word and will and way, trusting you to empower us to do what is right. Lord, help us to humble ourselves before you. It's easy for us to see that there's a lot of things going on that are certainly out of our control, but Lord, we're thankful that you're in control. You deserve all the honor and praise. Help us to stand in honor of your worthy, worthy name. May you be glorified in our lives, in our attitudes, and Lord, may we be instruments in thy hands used to bring you glory and praise, and chiefly, Lord, to bring souls to you. People need the Lord. And Lord, I pray you'd help us to be a good testimony and witness for you in these days. Again, Lord, if you've spoken to hearts, I pray we get things right with you. Even now, as Andrea plays our hymn of invitation, giving us a few moments here to spend in quietness, uh, talking with you. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> joining us online. We'll be back uh, Sunday morning, same schedule as last week. Pastor Brent will be doing our Sunday school hour at 10, and then I'll be preaching at 11, and my father at 6. At least that's our plan, and I uh, trust that you'll uh, join us at, at those times. Uh, stay healthy. Again, thank you, church family, for your faithfulness and uh, making sure your tithes and offerings are taken care of. I'm, I'm uh, grateful, uh, humbled by your uh, faithfulness to the Lord. And uh, we trust that it won't be long. We'll be able to be united again as a church family all together in the Lord's house. So uh, stay safe. And if we can be a help to you, please uh, don't be afraid to reach out to us. All right. Have a good evening.